Hi, and welcome once again to our Sunday School class called A Living Faith as we continue to look through the book of James. This lesson we are titling The Attraction of Autonomy, and we'll be looking at James chapter 4 verses 13 through 17. There are three main points that we want to make uh, during this, uh, as we go through this passage. And the first of those is that Christians should not presume to know the future, but should always leave room for God's will to overrule theirs. And that is covered in verses 13 through 15. So let's dive in and let's begin by looking at verse 13 of James chapter 4. It says, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. This, uh, James here is addressing um, merchants within the community, and uh, he starts out by saying, now listen. Um, that phrase should get our ears to perk up a little bit, because that phrase is usually used to get someone's attention for a rebuke. Um, many of you know those catchwords when you were raised as a child, the thing that your parents would say that would make you go, ooh, they're serious. Well, that's kind of the way that, that this works. And uh, so James is saying, hey, listen up. I'm not real happy about this. This is something you got to pay attention to. And so that's the now listen. Then he says, you who say. Well, we've been looking a lot at James's audience and who he's speaking of here. And so when he says, you who say, the question I, that, is, that is asked by many people is, who are the you? Who is he speaking to? And particularly, is he speaking here to believers or to non-believers? Or more generally, just to, to anyone who will listen. Um, there are those that believe that he is speaking to non-believers, and their justification for that, I, I personally think, is uh, a little weak. But it is the idea that that these rich merchants wouldn't be Christian; um, that the, the most of the Christians were poor, and that the rich were not yet Christians. You may remember Jesus talking about how hard it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven it is like a camel going through the eye of a needle. Um, but then when the, the disciples ask him, well, then who can be saved? His answer is, well, with God, what's not possible with man is possible with God. And so to say that, it, that it, this is clearly directed to non-believers because they appear to be rich merchants, I think misses the mark. There are those, another group that believes that it is speaking to believers. Um, and, the re and their reasoning for this is, comes in the question, why would James be instructing non-Christians in the first place? Why would he think that he has a right to tell non-Christians how they should behave? And it really comes down to the message, uh, particularly when we're talking about um, judgment and rebukes, is that message for the church or is that message for the world? And so there are those that believe that James is speaking to believers here. We're going to see a little bit later some more evidence that it could be for believers. But regardless, I think as we read this, um, the, the lessons that he is teaching here are going to be uh, good for believers and non-believers because the truth is the truth. And whether it applies to somebody that's willing to accept it doesn't change it from being the truth. And so our job in the church is to present the truth to all. And so that is what we, uh, that is what I think James is doing here. He is speaking. Um, I tend to believe that his audience probably are Christians, uh, but at the same time, it does not negate the, the, uh, the importance and the reality of the matter he's going to be te teaching about here. The next phrase in that verse, it says, um, we will go. And uh, so now listen, you who say, 
today or tomorrow we will go. And what this is doing, the problem with this is that it is ignoring God's sovereignty. He's drawing out their, their arrogance of being autonomous, of being uh, independent from God, to think that they can make their plans on their own. And there's two things here that, that we can look at um, to see how their arrogance has, has really, um, I suppose you could say, perverted uh, their understanding of God and how all this works. And that, the first point is their confidence, in, they had this confidence that their plans were going to happen. There was no sense of, God, if you want these plans to happen, no, they were going to make these plans happen. And that is a, a bit of not just confidence in those plans, it's overconfidence in those plans. Uh, the idea he is saying is you have to, you cannot ignore that God's sovereign. He is sovereign over all of our plans. And they will only happen if he, in his sovereignty, allows them to happen. And so uh, James is challenging the way these merchants, these, these traders, the, the, um, the way that they are uh, going about their business. And so the second thing that he, that he says here is it, that he challenges is the confidence not only that their plans will happen, but that they will succeed. Um, that because he says that tomorrow that tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. So that is what they're trying to do. It's, so it's this overconfidence that their plans are going to succeed because they're independently going to be putting in their hard work to make that happen. So what this really challenges us for us is this this idea of proud complacency. And I think it's a challenge for us too, as we look at our world, um, we have a tendency, uh, well, a lot of us have a tendency to separate the spiritual from the secular. Um, and so we, we have our church life and, and we have our, our, um, our family life in the church. And yeah, we read our Bible, we do uh, we go to church, we say our prayers and all that. But then we have our work life. And it almost feels like that work life is a separate secular life. Um, and particularly among somebody that maybe has not matured that much in their faith. And so they see that they have these two worlds. And James is reminding us, no, there's only one. James is... James is saying that God is sovereign over all of it, which means he's sovereign over your plans. So your 401k, God is sovereign over that. Your job, God is sovereign over that. Um, and all of it, we need to realize, can be taken away. And that leads us to verse 14, and, and uh, where he begins to talk about how temporal a lot of this can be, particularly when we're putting our trust and the danger is when we're putting our trust in something that is temporal. So in verse 14, he says, Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And so what he's addressing here, he says, You do not even know. He's pointing out the folly of autonomy. Of the folly of thinking that we can run our own lives, because quite frankly, we don't know. And there's uh, a number of things that we don't know. Um, and in humility, we have to continue to remember, we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. And so again, here, looking at the you, uh, the word that is used there for the you is, it, it's a general term that really kind of means people such as you or whomever, it's generally being applied here. Uh, it's not a specific person, but all of us, we don't know. Uh, and that's the, the, the point that he's trying to point out here. And, and the word when he says no there, that means a general 
lack of knowledge about the future. I don't know what's going to happen when I walk out my front door and get in my car and drive down the block. I, be, anything can happen. I don't know what's going to happen in our church. Um, I don't know. I mean, who would have thought a year ago uh, that we'd go into a pandemic that would drastically impact the way we do church? We don't know. And so this is this general lack of knowledge that we have about the future. And that should keep us dependent upon God. That should keep us humble in our spirit. The fact that we don't know what is going to unfold in the future uh, should keep us humble and, and submitting our plans, therefore, to God. And then it moves on. Uh, he says, he talks about what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then you then are gone or and then vanishes. And so the um, this now he gets into a bit of a more specific uh, knowledge here. And that is really talking about the knowledge of our death, meaning we don't know part of the future that we don't know is how long we're going to live. And we are told in the scriptures that God knows. Uh, he All of our days, days are ordained. He knows every breath that we're going to take. Um, but we don't. And so, therefore, uh, it is arrogant for us to think that, you know what, um, I'm going to live to be 90 years old, or I'm going to, whatever it is, it, there's an arrogance in that to be thinking that way. Rather, we need to be surrendering not only our future plans and our business plans, but our very life to the will of God. Then it says, uh, there's two ways to interpret this next phrase, where in the NIV it says, what is your life? And it's a question. And that's one way to uh, translate it, but it could also be translated, what your life will be. Uh, as a statement. And so really what that does is it it directs us to um, either the first part of the sentence. So does what is your life? Does that go to the first part or does it go to the second part? If we interpret it, what is your life? It would appear that it goes to the second part. It, he asks a question and then he answers it. You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. But if it is what your life will be, then it applies to the first part. You do not even know what will happen tomorrow, what your life will be. Uh, regardless, uh, and, and there's nuances as to why one uh, translation or version will put it one way and another version of the Bible uh, that you might read will put it another way. And it's very nuanced and it's... Uh, and it's very difficult to tell which it should actually be. And we can get really hung up on that. Regardless, the point that it's trying to make is that we don't know um, how long we're going to live and we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And so that is uh, the point that it's trying to make. And then when it talks about you are a mist, again here it is pointing out just how temporal our life is. It says it appears and it and it vanishes. In the NIV, it says vanishes. In the Greek, um, a better way maybe in the English to translate that, it appears and disappears. In fact, some, some uh, versions of the Bible do translate it that way. And the reason that that may be a little better is because even in the Greek, where appears and disappears uses the same root, in the Greek, the two words use the same root in the same way. It's kind of a play on words there that, that says something is going to come quickly and then it is going to go away. And so when it talks about this mist, I, I want you, we live in the Northwest, our mist can last for days, um, but this isn't the same situation. This is a very uh, arid climate. And so you will get the mist off of the off of the sea, off of the uh, Mediterranean uh, Sea, and it'll blow in for a little bit, 
and then it'll hit that desert climate and just disappear. Um, I, when I was over in Israel, I got to see just how uh, temporary that mist can be because uh, you wake up and it might be a little bit foggy, but boy, it goes away real fast. We get a little bit of that here too um, when, it's, when we don't have as much humidity. Um, but the point is, it is quick. It is so temporal. Your life is like that, which really makes us have to think about why do we pay so much attention to this life? With the exception of being, this life being the only life in which we can come and submit to Jesus Christ, uh, we aren't given multiple lives to do that. We're given one life in, in order to do that. Um, it, it, that. We need to pay close attention to this life in that regard. But we also need to live within this, uh, this awareness that eternal life in heaven, I mean, this life is nothing. It is a mist. It is a second in the timeline. And, and sometimes I think we forget the reality of eternal life, that most of, not, not just most of, an overwhelmingly majority of our life is going to be spent in the afterlife. And so why do we focus so much and worry so much about this life? And of course, there's balance that needs to come with that. Augustine uh, was writing about this, and, and he's talking about um, worrying about healing somebody who's sick. And he said, this is what he says, restoring health for a time to a man's body amounts to no more than extending his breath for a little while longer. Therefore, it should not be considered of great importance because it is temporal, not eternal. Well, I hope you get what he's trying to say. I think he maybe is using, I don't know if he means to use hyperbole or if he really means it this way. He might mean that, you know what? You're going to die, so don't go to the doctor. I don't know if that's what he means. Um, if he does, I would completely disagree with him on that aspect of it uh, because we are, life is sacred and we are to protect life and we are to, um, have the attitude that that Paul had, you know, to to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Um, yes, both are important. And as long as we're living, we are living unto the Lord. We are living to fulfill his purposes, to bring him honor. And so, yes, we pay attention to this life as it relates to God and what he has called us to do in the short years that he's given us here. But at the same time, what I really think Augustine is trying to point out is that this life is so temporal that we should pay more attention to, to the eternal, to seeking the kingdom, to, uh, uh, I mean, even, even Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And so that, that portion is, is more important and then the earthly things, and all these things shall be given unto you. The earthly things that we worry about, those are secondary. And so it's just a reminder to us that when, particularly when things are going tough in this life, um, it's the case of living a life of this too shall pass. There is something better, and we will get through this, and we will enter into it. It also reminds us that death for a Christian is not a defeat. It is a, a victory because now we have entered into the reality of who we are supposed to be, the reality of, of being righteous before Christ. And so it is this, this idea of, it, James is just trying to point out to us just how temporary this life is. So instead of focusing only on this life, we ought to be focusing on God's kingdom. And that's what he, he gets to next in verse 15. It says, instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or do that. And so here he switches. Uh, 
in the previous uh, two verses, they were this negative rebuke. He was pointing out what they were doing wrong. But now he switches it from a negative rebuke to a positive exhortation. He's now going to tell them the right way to, to approach life, to approach business. And, and he said, and so that is um, uh, that he is, he is um, pointing out that we need to submit all of our plans to the Lord's will. In this, we talked about who's his audience. And this is probably one of the strongest suggestions that the audience is uh, Christians within the church. And the reason being is it says, if the Lord, he's talking about you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will. And so he's, it's this concept, uh, bottom line, that the thought process is, if these aren't Christians, they're not really gonna care what the Lord's will is. Um, and so they, the scholars that I was reading from, they believe that this is directed mostly toward Christians because of uh, the language here about drawing upon or appealing to the Lord's will to be the moral compass by which they do their business. Um, the phrase ought to say, uh, I want to look at that just a little bit where it says, instead, you ought to say. What this does is, once again, as we have seen, um, James is really tied speech to our heart. Um, and, and all through this, as we have been looking, he is making that connection that our tongue, the things we say, really are a reflection of our heart. Um, out of the heart, the mouth speaks is, is the concept that he is addressing here. And so, what he is saying is we ought to have our words reflect a heart. And I think there's three ways here that he's telling us that, that our heart needs to be and our words need to reflect. And the first is that we should have a heart of humility. When we are making our plans without thinking of what God wants, that's arrogance. And so... James is telling us, you know what? You ought to say, if it is the Lord's will. In other words, you ought to recognize that he is, uh, he is sovereign. And so uh, it really challenges us to, to, uh, to develop a real heart of humility. Um, and then that leads to the second one. A heart of humility will lead to a heart of surrender. And so he's saying that we should be surrendering our plans. Uh, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. So we surrender our plans um, and we, we recognize that God is the one who is sovereign over us. And then that then will also, a heart of humility, a heart that is surrendered, will lead to a heart of obedience. So when God directs us, or God stops us from doing our from our plans. Uh, we are to obey, and it will reflect. So when we when it says you ought to say, if we can say that, if it is the Lord's will, will we will live and do this or that? It reflects this humility, our surrender, and our obedience to the sovereignty of God. When it talks about if it is the Lord's will. Um, the thing I want to point out here is this is more than a formula. I think sometimes uh, we do that. Uh, we'll, even in our prayers, we do that. Um, we'll add in, uh, if the Lord wills, or um, according to your will, Lord. But if those are only words, then, it, then it's just a, an expression. Um, kind of like sometimes the way we treat amen. When we pray and say amen at the end of our prayer, um, I know I'm challenged to remember, no, that's a statement of saying, let it be so, it is so. It's acknowledging the truth of what of that prayer and the truth of your heart behind that prayer. Um, but do we really see it that way? Or is it the word we use to end a prayer? Um, well, same here. We can do the same with this phrase, if it is the Lord's will. 
And if we do that, then we really have not surrendered to a heart of humility and, and we, have, we are not in obedience. Um, it's, just, it's just words at that point. Craig Blomberg says it this way. He says, this expression should be interpreted neither as a pious addendum to, repeat, to be repeated mindlessly or as an expression of fatalism that excuses us from taking responsibility for our actions. Rather, it ought to convict our hearts of God's sovereignty in every area of our lives, even as we seek to please him by following his will as best we can discern it. So he actually brings out two points there, um, that this phrase, if it is the Lord's will, that that shouldn't just be that mindless expression that I was talking about, but it also shouldn't be uh, just a, a fatalistic, well, if God's going to do it, he's going to, and so we don't do any planning. Um, we, and, and therefore, if God's going to do it, you know what, I'm not responsible. I'm not responsible for my business failing when I have been uh, lazy or I have been um, operating deceitfully, uh, not paying attention to the details. It's very easy to say, well, it's the Lord's will. It happened. It's the Lord's will. When in fact, maybe we should look at ourselves and see what our response is. Have we been listening and diligent in following God's will in our business? Have we been working hard um, and, and doing the work as unto the Lord? Um, so, the next section that he talks about here in that verse is he says, we will live. And so here it's talking about we shouldn't presume, we should say that it is the Lord's, that, that only if it is the Lord's will, and the first thing he points out, that includes uh, even the guarantee of life. Do we presume that we have the right to live a certain number of years? Um, the fact is we should all be destroyed. Because of our sinfulness, we should all be destroyed. And that would be the just penalty for our sin. Um, but God in his great mercy is patient and he has chosen not to destroy us. But we can't presume upon the idea that we are going to be given a long life. Um, we can hope for it. We can surrender to God's sovereignty in that. But we should not presume that we will live. And then the next phrase, it says, do this or that. And that's really referring to our plans in all circumstances. It's not specific. It may, it, it's encompassing uh, everything we do. Um, so the way I, I, uh, I should not presume that I can lead my family in the way I want to lead my family. I need to lead my family the way God wants to. The decisions I make about uh, all kinds of things, purchases, um, jobs, uh, uh, vacations. I mean, you stop and think about how many things, you, how many decisions you make every day. And the question is, are you making those according to what you want? Or are you making those according to what God wants? And as we look at this, um, it's easy then to to uh, take it too far as well and to think that it is sinful then to make plans. I don't have to take us very far through the scriptures to see that plans were made uh, when um, uh, Nehemiah um, and others were, were I'm checking my, myself to see if I'm getting the right people here, when they were rebuilding the temple uh, after the destruction of the temple, they had plans, they took measurements, they, they uh, organized it. And so the point is that it's not just about us making plans. That's not the problem. We can make plans. We should make plans. It is wise and prudent for us to make plans. But it is also a reminder to submit our plans to God's sovereignty and to recognize the frailty of life. And so one of the things as we look at making plans I, I want to talk about is one of the questions I often get 
is how do I know that the plans I'm making are a part of God's will? And that's a tough question. And, and if you're asking the question, then you already are starting with the right heart. And I think God is going to honor that and he is going to guide you in that. And I am a believer that you, as you are making plans, uh, that first of all, you check the scriptures to make sure your plans are not contrary to scripture. So obviously deception, um, cheating people in, in business, um, the scriptures talk a lot about using the proper measurements and right weights so that you're not cheating people. Uh, so as we're making plans, the scriptures themselves can guide us um, uh, a long ways in, in making our plans. Um, also the principles, not just the specifics of scriptures, but the principles love your neighbor as yourself. There's a principle that impacts our business. And so those principles also will guide us in making our plans. Uh, is this just about me? Is this for others? Um, and then the final thing is sometimes you just have to step forward. You listen to what God is telling you. You pray, you, you seek it out, but there comes a time where you may not have the answer yet, but you have to make a decision, so you step forward, submitting even that step to God's sovereignty. And you trust that God will direct those steps. And so um, as, as you are stepping forward and he puts roadblocks in your way, again, you have to determine, are these roadblocks just tests and challenges? Or are these roadblocks God redirecting me down a different path and we need to pray to the Holy Spirit that he gives us wisdom and discernment in those situations. Um, but to just freeze and do nothing uh, is not the answer either. And so we step forward and we do trust God uh, and his sovereignty to guide us in those situations. So let's go ahead and um, move on here to the second major portion of this scripture and that the general concept of the second portion of it is that this kind of presumption about the future is in fact boasting in one's own arrogance and so in verse 16 uh, James says as it is you boast in your arrogant schemes all such boasting is evil um as I, I, I'm stumbling right now because I, I'm wondering if I've been saying Paul sometimes. If I have said Paul instead of James, please forgive me. And if I've said James, great, I've done it right. Um, but this is James speaking here. So James is saying, as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. For Christians, we need to see that when we boast... Uh, about our plans, that there is that arrogance that is there, that that isn't just um, a flaw, it's evil. I think sometimes we actually reward arrogance. We tend to, uh, within our society, I should say, our society rewards arrogance. Um, we tend to see those people as being confident. And, there, and it's important for us to understand there is a huge difference between confidence and arrogance. Uh, arrogance actually is more steeped in a lack of confidence because when you're truly confident in the Lord, you don't need to boast. We're going to see here, and that's the, the phrase we're going to look at, where it says you boast here. This is always used as, almost always used as a presumptive bragging, that you presume that, that something is going to happen and you brag about that. And it's almost always negative. Um, there are some uh, examples of, of where it is not negative. Um, and so uh, some examples of that. Uh, hold on just a second. Some, we're going to get to those in a little bit. Some examples of that. Let's move on to the next phrase. 
So it says, you boast in your arrogant schemes. And there's, again, two possible translations to that. The first one is, their boasting is a reflection of the state of their arrogance. So you boast in your arrogant scheme, schemes means, could mean, that in your arrogance, in your arrogant schemes, you are boasting. In that state uh, of, of arrogance, it is reflected by your boasting. That's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is that they're actually boasting about their independence. They are boasting about their arrogance. That they in that they're boasting that they have the ability to do all of this, to to go to this town and to trade and to get wealthy and to make money. So they are boasting that they can do that in and of themselves, independent autonomous from God. And so that their boasting is in in that actual arrogance. And uh, the and so as we look at which is it talking about here, I think both have some validity in, as far as being truth. Um, but I think in this case, it is the second one that is the, the more accurate one. Uh, in the New Testament, the word um, boast in, uh, that is almost always followed by the object of their boasting. Both Douglas Moo and Craig Blomberg uh, agree on this one, that, that um, in the New Testament, when you say you boast in some, you boast, what you are boasting in is going to come next. And so in our case, it would be you are boasting in, the object would be your arrogant schemes. That's what you're boasting in, your ability to pull all of this off is what you're boasting in. Um, that may mean, seem like subtleties, but I'm hoping that it will help us to understand the passage uh, a little deeper. And then it says, all such boasting is evil. And so James rightfully condemns this kind of boasting, uh, bragging about what we're going to do. He condemns, and he condemns it because, again, it denies the sovereignty of God. Um, that is important for us. Uh, I know it seems like I'm repeating that sovereignty of God thing here, but that is the overriding factor in this whole passage, is that we need to surrender to the sovereignty of God. And when we don't, we need to see the reality of that and the seriousness of that. James says, all such boasting is evil. Now, that does not indicating that all boasting is sin. Uh, there are things we should be able to boast about, but they don't have anything to do with us in the sense of it's not in, we're not boasting in our strength. We're not boasting in what we're going to do. In fact, Scripture reminds us that we are to boast in such things as the death of Christ. We boast in that because that's our salvation, and that's our only salvation. Uh, we can't do that on our own. We, we are helpless uh, in our state of sinfulness. And so the only thing that we can boast in is Christ and his death and resurrection. We, and part of that is Jake, we're also told by Paul to boast in our weaknesses, or he says he boasts in his weaknesses. And I think that is an example for us. When we boast in our weaknesses, we again are saying, you know what? God is supreme. I'm weak. I need God. That's worth boasting about. Uh, and boasting, therefore, in God's strength. These are just some examples of things we can boast about. But when we boast about our uh, uh, abilities, uh, we get to the question of who receives the honor. Why are we boasting? Is it to make people look at us? Or is it to make people look at our sovereign, uh, majestic God who is loving and who is guiding and, and directing us and empowering us uh, to be able to achieve whatever it is he wants us to achieve? Who are we boasting in? And so that is the question. And then this third section of the, this passage, the overall thought is that Christians should really know better. 
that as Christians, if we, um, if we know the sovereignty of God, then we should know better than to boast, than to be bragging about um, our future, our plans. Um, verse 17 says this. It says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. The first section of that says, if anyone then knows the good that they ought to do. What is that good? What is the good that we ought to do? Well, first of all, we, we understand James Old Testament when they talk about, uh, and, and Paul as well, when they talk about the good that we should do, it, it is first of all talking about the uh, God's sovereignty and the law. It's talking about obedience to God's sovereignty and the law. That is the good we ought to do. We should obey God in all the things he tells us to do as we read them in the scriptures. Um, the second thing that it, that it refers to is the mercy and justice for the poor and the oppressed. James pays a lot of attention saying that the deeds that we should be doing, this, this faith that we have that is reflected in our deeds is reflected toward those who are poor, toward those who are oppressed, toward those who cannot help themselves. Um, and so it, this is another way that we are doing good. It is by caring for those um, showing mercy uh, to those that need mercy and, and making sure that justice is offered for those that, that cannot get justice, that um, cannot, um, that, that are oppressed. And, and so it is two aspects there of doing good, obeying God, but also caring for uh, other people. So I suppose it goes back to our two greatest commands, doesn't it? Loving God and loving others. The point, the reason this comes up here is he is speaking um, to an audience where there is this huge disparity between the merchants and most of the other people. In fact, many of the other people may have looked at these merchants with distrust because frankly, as James has said, Previously, he says, isn't it the rich that are dragging you off to court? Um, the mistrust has been earned uh, in amongst a lot of rich businessmen uh, and women that they are taking advantage of the poor. And so there is this, 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 um, this unity that exists between them. The rich ha are taking advantage of the poor and the poor are not trusting the rich. And so here... Uh, he is challenging um, the rich, the merchants, those who, who have jobs and are making a, a living at it. He is challenging them that how they should how they should do their job. He is challenging them that um, they should be caring in their jobs. They should be caring for the poor, and maybe by doing so they begin to bridge that gap and bring about reconciliation within the church. And then it says, uh, finishing that sentence, it says, for anyone who knows the good, they ought to do. And then it says, and doesn't do it, it is sin to them. Um, failure to exercise both of those examples we just talked about, failure to exercise obedience to God and, and his word, and failure to exercise mercy and justice for the poor, James is saying it is sin. If we don't do good to those people, it's not, it's not an option. We are sinning against God at that point. Um, and so what it provides us, first of all, is an example of business ethics. Yes, the scriptures speak about the way we are to run our businesses. And so it really talks to us about the ethics. Our, the way we run our business um, needs to reflect our submission to the will of God. It needs to reflect our care for others. Our businesses are not meant just for us. 
Um, those of you that are employers, um, you know that, that there are people that are counting on you. Um, their livelihood is counting on you because you are their employer. And so the way you treat them is important. Um, it is, that is in much, much of what James is trying to help us understand. As we uh, go about our business, our, we have to have strong biblical ethics in the way we do them. And I have talked to enough business owners uh, to know, because some of you have shared very strongly with me, that, that when you run your business according to the way God would want you to run your business, so in other words, you do so with integrity and honesty and care for others, when you run your business that way, typically that business is going to be more successful. Uh, and, and again, depending on how you define success, um, you may get some short-term gains by, by cheating, but you get a long-term reputation. Um, and so you want to, I remember when I was in business school, um, one of my professors, we were talking about uh, balance sheets and figuring out your assets, and he brought up that goodwill is an asset that is priceless. You cannot put a price on goodwill. Uh, having a good reputation within the community because of the way you run your business. And, uh, and so it's just a reminder to us that, that God does care about the ethics we use in running our business. And this is what James is telling these business people as well. It is also telling us not only in our business, but in our life as well. This is an example of a life ethic that we are to live our lives uh, in humility and submission. And so I, I want to challenge each of us to kind of do a gut check. Um, do we struggle with arrogance? We might be quick to say, no, no, I'm a modest person. Well, that may be arrogant in saying that, but we, we could be quick and maybe our the way we present ourselves is modest. But James is telling us if we're going about our plans without uh without surrendering those plans, without fought, try, uh, attempting to discern God's will first, then we are being arrogant. We have lost our humility. And so it is a challenge to us to really make sure that everything we're doing in life, in our jobs, in our homes, in our own personal lives, that they are surrendered in humility to the will of God, to his sovereignty. Um, and that's what this section is speaking about. Um, this, we have two more lessons in the book of James. This is my final uh, lesson in the book of James. The next two lessons uh, Frank will be teaching. And then um, once we conclude James, we're gonna take a couple week break. I think it's two weeks, it may just be one week, but we're gonna break for Easter. And then following Easter, we will begin um, a, a new section on the five points of Calvinism. And, Jane, and and Frank is going to take those. I asked him to do that just because I'm trying to balance some other things out. But at the same time, I'm going to give some, some plugs here. Um, I'm excited about that, that lesson in the five points of Calvinism because it's going to coincide with what we're preaching on uh, in our Sunday morning services as well. And I certainly invite you to be a part of that. We're going to be looking at the attributes of God. And the attributes of God impact our understanding of the five points of Calvinism. And so those two things are going to go nicely together. So I encourage you to pay attention to online, at least until we can get in person online to uh, the, the lessons on the five points of Calvinism, but also join us on Sunday mornings for our lessons on the attributes of God. That's all following Easter. Um, enjoy these questions. Take some time to, that we have at the end of this. Take some time to reflect on them with your family and be blessed. Uh, let me close with prayer. Lord God, I thank you that you are sovereign. I thank you that, that you know the future. Lord, may we surrender 
uh, all of our plans, all of our desires, everything to you. And Lord, I know personally, I know sometimes it's a struggle. Personally, sometimes uh, we can be tempted with thinking so much about this world that we fail to recognize that your plans for us extend way beyond the temporal. And so may we live our lives within that balance of, of, of recognizing your sovereignty, recognizing the, the, that our lives are amiss, and may we, we surrender everything to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good day, and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.